everybody and welcome to my buddy Steven's McLaren 570 GT. Steve has been a friend for an awful long time now and I've actually had a number of his cars on the channel. In fact, one of the first ever videos that I did was with his C63 and I'm so glad to have seen him progress from that into a Lotus then an Alfa Romeo 4C and now finally into his first supercar, the McLaren 570 GT. I'm so glad to have this car on the channel for a number of reasons. First off, I featured many McLarens, but not the GT, and this was a very popular car. Secondly, because it demonstrates, in a nutshell really, everything both wrong and right with McLaren. This car was actually a big success for the company and sold in more or less the same numbers as the 570S Coupe. Yet the car which technically followed it, the McLaren GT, was an absolute disaster in terms of sales. McLaren don't really seem to have shifted many of them at all. How many left would tell you that there are about 50 of those here in the UK, but that is a notoriously unreliable site. And um, I've in fact only seen one of them in the wild. So let's start with the basics, shall we? What is a 570 GT? Well, it's one of McLaren's Sport Series cars and an extremely close relative of the 570S. The giveaway is at the back, where instead of some flying buttresses, this has pretty much a hatch, and you can indeed open it and access a reasonably sized luggage area. This is also a car that was designed to be just a little bit more comfortable than the regular S, having 15% softer dampers at the front, 10% softer at the rear, and steering, which was 2% slower. In practice, you'd need to drive the cars back to back to realize the differences and confusingly you could later get the 570 GT with the S suspension and that brings me on to my first sort of negative point and it's not really much of one don't worry this is not intended to be another McLaren bashing video quite the opposite in fact the problem really with the McLarens is that they're all, by supercar standards, exceedingly practical, comfortable and usable. This has a nice big boot at the front, reasonable storage at the back and it's a really pleasant ride even over poorly paved roads. It is of course also ungodly quick with 570 horsepower on tap, plenty of torque and only about 1500 kilos to drag down the road. So this should really impress even a fairly well seasoned performance junkie. It is, I think, the hatch which really drew people to this over the S. And once the 570 Spider was out, I think really there were only two cars you were going to buy if you wanted an entry-level McLaren. The 540C made absolutely no sense because it was quite a bit less car than a 570S in practice for not that much less money. So if you wanted a coupe, you'd buy a 570 GT, and if you wanted a Spider, you'd buy a 570 Spider, leaving the 570S coupe kind of no man's land really. This I think perhaps is the better looking car too, so really it was a no-brainer for most customers. Many of the core components here are exactly the same as you'd find in nearly every other McLaren. To wit, a 3.8 litre twin turbocharged V8 engine built by Regardo, a 7-speed McLaren seamless shift gearbox built by Graziano, a carbon fibre tub built by some lovely people in Austria, and bodywork thrown at the car by some nice people in Woking. To sit in, it is very much the same again as all of its stable mates, much more cramped than you might think. An R8 or a Ferrari 488 feels like a lounge compared to these. In fact, they really are much different to many a Lotus I've been in. If anything, I think my old Evora might have actually felt a touch roomier. But if you are a sports car fan, this thing is pure pornography. That incredibly low front means that you've got an excellent view of the road and you feel like you're absolutely on top of the tarmac. You can place the car with precision. And although the engine is a touch lethargic at low RPM, once you've got it spinning beyond about three and a half thousand, it pulls pretty hard. It's only really once you then get to about six and a half thousand where this shows its deficit over, say, a 12C. You have, of course, different settings you can use down here, and you have to press the active button if you actually want to use them, otherwise the car will just do what it thinks best. For road use, I recommend handling in normal and powertrain in sport. And that means you get everything that you need. Over the bigger McLaren's 12C650-720, this is missing the clever interlink dampers, the proactive chassis control. Confusingly, on the subsequent GT, McLaren introduced what they called proactive damper control, which you'd think would be the same system. It didn't help that everyone said the GT had the same suspension as the 720, and the active anti-roll bars, to me, are a really big part of that. 
but that's by the by. This is still a supremely well damped car. You can tell that the steering in this is just a touch slackened versus the 570. A really well set up 570 steers like nothing else. I have to contextualize this because when I say that maybe the steering isn't quite as good as the 570S, I mean it's a, you know, a 9.7 rather than a, a 9.8. This is in no way, shape or form a bad steering car, uh, quite the opposite. Most things you'll have driven won't steer anywhere near as well or as naturally as this. It is absolutely magical. Also, here's a car you really genuinely can daily drive, and I know Steve is intent on putting as many miles on this as he can. 570 GTs weren't all built equal though, so if you are on the hump for one, there are a few things to look out for. The GT was actually a little bit more expensive than the S, which doesn't always make a lot of sense, about nine or 10,000 pounds. So not a vast difference, but enough to notice, especially if you were buying them new at less price, as some poor people did. To counter this, later on McLaren did improve the spec list, so you got extended leather as standard. Some early cars didn't have that, and I have driven one with the regular interior, and it was horrible. Had absolutely no place in a McLaren at any price point, so I'm very glad that they got rid of that. They also then gave you carbon ceramics as standard. The dash here got a little bit better. Really early cars had a slightly different layout, and there were general improvements to the car. It gets attention like nothing else, really. In fact, you probably need something like that beautiful TVR Tuscan to really get anywhere near as many heads turning as you will in a McLaren. And the best part is that pretty much every McLaren is going to do that. If you want something a little bit more subtle, you'll just have to buy one of these in a slightly more dour colour, or maybe get a Taycan like the gentleman behind. This car actually has a pretty generous spec too. It's got the Bowers and Wilkins sound system, which is a big improvement over the regular one. It's got the mixed leather in Alcantara. It's got the carbon pack inside and this spectacular volcano orange paintwork. I've done the drive-bys for this before the review, I'm doing these a little bit backwards today, and this car going down the road looks amazing. And I have to say, it actually sounds pretty good too. This is a common failing of many a McLaren, some of them they just didn't sound that great and in here it is a touch underwhelming especially at low rpm but when you press on from outside it actually sounds pretty good now it's not a 360 challenge to Dali, nor was it ever going to be in terms of sonic pleasure but it's not a bad sounding car maybe as things get a little bit worse i'm going to look back on these and realize that maybe i've been a little bit too harsh on how they sounded in the same way that i now look back on die hard 2 and go Actually, that was a really good movie, wasn't it? Simply because you don't get that kind of macho, blood-filled action fest anymore, so anything that's roughly like that, I automatically give an extra two points. People let you out. It doesn't happen so often in a Ferrari, I can tell you that much. And a McLaren, they do. In truth, this is about one of the slowest cars you'll ever buy because whenever you stop in it, you will spend a long time talking to just about everybody. And I love that about cars. As McLarens go, this is fairly common, but in truth, as cars go, it's still fairly rare. Something like 200 of these listed on the road versus like double or triple as many Ferrari 458 or 488s. They made roughly similar numbers of 570S Coupe, uh, a lot more 720s, although the listing online, I think, lumped 720 Spider and Coupe all together. That being said, I haven't really seen very many 720 Spiders. I've seen one in the wild. Uh, the same, actually, for the new GT. I've seen one out there. So what is it about the new GT that made it such a disaster when this one was so successful? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but before we do, I just want to enjoy this car quickly. I will say again, 
McLarens were the cars Lotus could simply never afford to build. I really love my Lotus, as everybody knows, and I absolutely adore these McLarens. There really is very little else this side of a Lotus that drives quite the way that a McLaren does. As a supercar, this is nearly without fault. And that really is the root, I think, of the GT's failure. What McLaren make, what they excel at building, is supercars that drive like no other, yet are supremely practical. Even in the Spider, you have that little extra storage under the tonneau cover. You can do big miles in them very happily. The 570 GT, everybody knew, really was more or less an option pack, a trim level. It was only a little bit more than the 570S, and it was still a 570. They weren't trying to kid anybody. With the GT, McLaren tried to go out of their way to build something a little bit different, and I think they failed particularly with their marketing because they tried to say that this was something bold and new and redefining a genre. Well, okay, GT cars don't tend to have the engine in the middle. That's because you don't want it there on a GT car. You want it at the front. You want maybe a little bit of space for tiny seats in the back. You want a really big boot. The GT, to me, was McLaren just trying desperately to convince everybody what they built wasn't just another supercar. When it comes to their sports series cars, or now the Artura, which has taken over from it, McLaren only really need two models. You have the Spider and you have the Coupe. And the Coupe should always have a nice practical hatch like this. Or, if nothing else, the GT should be a package. It shouldn't be a whole car in its own right. It doesn't need to be. This rides so well. If you said to me, oh, do you want it even more comfortable? Uh, no. No, I don't. I, I, I don't need it at all. I would have the 570S pack on it because again, you only get just a little bit more sharpness. It's still an extremely plush car, but it just drives a little bit better. This, like I said though, absolutely no slouch. So with the new GT, what McLaren ultimately built wasn't really a great, different and unusual GT car. What they built was a slightly rubbishy supercar because they just tried to compromise everything where they'd already got the balance right. This is not a uniquely McLaren thing at all. After all, look at the reviews Ferrari got for the 550. Absolutely everybody loved it. And then look at the reviews for the 575. They look like nearly the same car, don't they? Yet everybody hated the 575 until pretty much its final incarnation. So it's very possible to make small changes and wind up with a pretty big difference. That's exactly what happened with McLaren. There is just so so much to love about this car. It's great for hoofing along. It doesn't sound as great in the cabin as it should. I really wish they would have found a way to get a little bit more of that noise piped into here because it does sound decent. When it goes past you, it sounds really good. This one has the sports exhaust on it. Very, very few of them don't. It doesn't make a big difference. If you're convinced a car you're driving doesn't have it, uh, double check because it may well do. The gearbox is beautiful. I love the shifter. The way McLaren have done their shifter, brilliant. If you don't know, it's basically a single piece, like a rocker, and you can go up or down from either way. So, you know, the right paddle, pull it to go up or push it to go down. I thought that was a gimmick. I thought you'd never really use that until I started driving these cars and I found myself using it all the time. Whenever you're in town, it's great. When I have my M3, sometimes I'd like to drive it from the sort of stick rather than the paddles because it feels a little bit more relaxed. And I do the same thing with the McLaren. I'm talking to you now and I can go up a gear, I can go down a gear, whatever. It's great. The action is one of the best you'll find in any OEM car. The engine, I know, got a lot of stick, and in truth, it is still some way short of the greatness of Ferrari's turbocharged lumps and a million miles away from their naturally aspirated engines. But don't be fooled into thinking it's without character. It's not, it's just not got the character that you'd expect. Curiously, these do actually sound even better than the 12C and 650 because they have a different exhaust manifold layout. These have equal length manifolds, whereas the 12C and 650 have unequal length, which I believe does give you a little bit more torque and various things, and, and that really will make a difference. Like I mentioned earlier, that's one area where you'll notice a difference between the engines. So the 570, at 6.5 to 8, it kind of holds its power, whereas the 12C, so my buddy Michael's a Volcano Red 12C that I've driven, that between 6.5 and 8, it just goes. It just digs and goes for it. Absolutely incredible. Very easy to pick up a lot of speed in this car very quickly. Now, 
Now today I'm not really going hell for leather, but I can tell you in these cars when you do really start pressing on, the rear end does go a little bit skittish, a little bit light, particularly under heavy braking where they can be um, entertaining to say the least. So bear that in mind if you're in, if you're coming into a corner and you're really piling on the anchors, the thing will move around. It's a little disconcerting, but you can get used to it. I always wanted these to feel a little bit more tied down than they do. They don't actually produce very much downforce, sort of, if any, really. The idea, I think, was to try and make it handle in a very neutral way, and, and that's what it does. This is really, I know I've said before that these are quite clearly not a sports car, they're a supercar, but McLaren tried very hard to get that sports car feeling in, and I'd say they, they largely succeeded. If you want to play with it, you can, but I'm not in a playful mood today. I'm just gonna enjoy the drive. The GT does have a sunroof, which is nice, but I think if I were to pick a car, I would go for the Spider because with the McLaren carbon tub, you don't really lose any rigidity. Still got a lot of practicality. Still a beautiful riding, driving thing, but you have the wind in your hair, you get a little bit more noise, and you have the little rear window that drops down and lets you just appreciate everything that little bit more. Can they break? Yes. Can you get a warranty for them that'll fix it if they do? Yes. Prices of these are all over the place. They start at around about £80,000, and it's between 80 and 90 is where I'd want to be for a good example of one of these. An early 570S, you can get them between sort of 70 and 80 if you're lucky. There are examples I've seen that have sold for sort of 75, 77, that have been very good cars with nothing really wrong with them. The GT, I think, does command a slight premium, but not a massive one. I'm hoping with the Artura we're going to see some of what I've talked about implemented because I'm pretty sure McLaren have realised that the GT has been a disaster. It doesn't help from what I know that they broke quite a lot. The new infotainment that they introduced didn't really work and indeed infotainment's one of the things in here where this is no real different to any other McLaren of the year. It's the old Iris 2 system that isn't very good but hey ho it is what it is. Reversing camera is okay in this. This has the GT pack. Uh, like Porsche, it incenses me that a GT can have the GT pack optioned, and that's a very important one because it has your front lift, has your, it has a reversing camera, has an upgraded alarm, and a few other things. GT pack and the S pack. That's what I'd want on one of these. Those are the two options. Everything else, Brucey bonus. The Bowers and Wilkins stereo. That's very nice to have. The interior on this one's perhaps a little on the bland side, but the good thing about McLarens is you don't see much of it. Like a Lotus, you're kind of just viewing through the glass, so the interior being a little bit meh, it doesn't really phase me that much. Even at town speeds, you can tell this is a car which is built by and designed for people that just love driving. Every single element of the controls is perfectly weighted from the resistance on the throttle pedal to the very smooth action of the carbon ceramic brakes to the steering, which, like I said, is just lacking in that immediacy and vibrance of a 570S, but is still wonderfully weighted. Hydraulic to McLaren, never really taken to electric steering, and I don't think they need to. Fuel economy in this car is also brilliant. If you are touring, you will get well over 30 mpg. I've heard figures of about 35 reported without too much trouble. And for a car with this performance potential, that's phenomenal. I have managed to develop this reputation as, you know, the world's premier McLaren basher. So allow me to at least leverage that for some good and say that even in my fabled position as number one enemy for Woking, this is a good car worth your money. No, this is a great car, really worth your money and your time, and yes, it will go wrong. But I also guarantee you that when it comes back from repairs, you'll take it out for a drive and you will forgive it all of its failings. And it will have some because it is still a supercar. None of them are perfect, trust me. Anyway, that's enough from me, please like. Comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. I uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye-bye.